right, guys. So um, <clears throat> welcome to, uh, to my talk on um, DevOps, uh, effective DevOps techniques. I am uh, currently working on uh, really trying to, to look at um, the, the whole landscape of, uh, of DevOps and um, try to, to see what we can do about focusing on certain areas and, and really exploring them. And one of the things that uh, has caught my, my attention lately is uh, this idea of a high-performing team. This comes to me because I just got back from uh, the Agile Austin conference last week. Uh, not that this was written in a week, but uh, it, it, the, the conference made it relevant to me. Uh, in dealing, or talking to a lot of people at the conference, we talked about high-performing Agile teams. And I'm like, high-performing Agile teams? And DevOps kind of sprung from, from Agile. Maybe we should, we, we should have high-performing DevOps teams. So let's see what that means today. Uh, first of all, we're going to start off a little bit about me. My current title and <clears throat> position is a cloud architect at a company called Infor. We're a software enablement company. So basically, if you're in the retail industry or the hospitality and you need software for your, your enterprise organization, give us a call. Uh, I'm with the retail group, so if you happen to own a, a, a chain of retail stores, we want to be your point of sale solution. That is my obligation to my company. It said, let's move on. Um, I'm an Agile DevOps and ChatOps evangelist. I cannot talk about that enough. I've spent maybe 10 years doing Agile evangelism, six-ish years doing DevOps, and about three years just getting really excited about ChatOps. And uh, I'm up for a beer with, uh, with any of you guys anytime during the rest of this conference to talk about any one of these three in depth. It's going to be awesome. All right, um, I'm really involved in, in user communities too. Uh, so um, I point out Agile Austin here. It's one of the, uh, the Agile groups back home. And at one point I even served as their, their technology chairman. Um, this is, community is important to me. It's one of the reasons why I'm here, because I know that there, there are other people in my, my industry and uh, other people in my community, if we're talking like the global stage with me being here in Copenhagen. Um, but I, I've gained a lot of knowledge from, from them, blog articles, coming to conferences like this, and this is my chance to, to give back. Um, I'm also a trained innovation games facilitator. I want you to know that this criteria, this, this qualification, has absolutely nothing to do with the reason why I'm up here on the stage today. I just thought I'd throw it in there, because innovation games are fun. All right, <clears throat> our agenda today, we got a big one, okay? We're going to talk about what a high-performing team is, and then I'm going to give you some things to, to do to, uh, to look at to get to a high-performing team. So we're going to talk about culture, blame-free environments, executive support, silos, training, communications, uh, OODA loops, context switching, scar tissue, and expectations. Think we're going to make it through this? Damn straight we will. All right, but we have to get started like right now. So what is a high-performing team? And, you know, um, I have a real problem with this because uh, when, when I try to answer this question, the thought that comes to mind is we all work in a different shop. We all have a different set of circumstances. It's not reasonable, in my opinion, for me to, uh, to say, okay, I am going to measure my team on uh, the number of, uh, of deployments done per day, and then take that to your organization and measure your organization against that same measurement. Because you're doing things different. You're probably not uh, an enterprise retail point of sale software enabler. You're probably not doing this with, uh, with a staff of, of cloud ops engineers spread in three different countries. Four different countries. I forgot about Sweden. Uh, so um, your circumstances are different. How can I logically uh, expect your measurement to, to be the same as mine? And uh, that's the other thing. In addition to the circumstances being uh, different, there are lots of different ways to, to measure. So I, I sat around, and I was like, God, how are we going to measure this? I, I didn't know until um, it occurred to me that our friends over at Puppet Labs 
once a year, produces something called the State of DevOps Report. Uh, go to Puppet Labs, search for it. Uh, there, I know that there are at least two available from 2016 and 2017. And it's a, a survey that Puppet Labs uh, um, cooperates with, uh, with other entities to, uh, to survey professionals in, in the industry, asking them questions about trends and uh, trying to use that information to synthesize into what a state of DevOps is. And they talk about performance a lot. So... Um, they keep talking about uh, how, how you have high-performing organizations and low-performing organizations. And uh, I, I love this phrase. High-performing organizations are decisively outperforming their lower-performing peers in terms of throughput. <laughs> well, yeah, duh. <laughs> of course they are. Um, but why? How are they getting this measurement? Well, they're doing it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is by looking at the number of deployments uh, per day or, the, or done, or, or the number of deployments in a, in a period. So um, high-performing teams for the last couple of years are consistently doing multi multiple deployments a day, whereas the low-performing teams are the ones that um, have one or two deployments a year, one a month, even one a week uh, uh, with uh, the last uh, State of DevOps report. They also look at lead time. So lead time is the, uh, the amount of time it takes from when you check in code into your, your source, co uh, source control system until you see it in production. That's going to be the uh, amount of time it takes to build your code. It's going to be the amount of time it takes to test your code, to certify it per, for production, do security testing, or whatever else your company says we need to do in order to take this from concept to production, from concept to cash. The third way that um, they, uh, they look at it is in terms of the amount of new work. And this, this I don't know. I like this measurement a lot. This, this speaks um, tons to me. But if we've got a high-performing organization, what does it make sense that they're not going to be doing the same thing over and over again? So they're not going to be making a lot of mistakes. They're, going, they're not going to be turning out defects. Uh, they're not going to, to be leaving things half done. They're just going to do it, get it out of the way. They're not going to have this, the, the feature creep. So it really looks at, uh, in this one metric, an entire breadth of an organization, if you think about it. So I, I really like this. And, and yes, high-performing organizations should do less time on, uh, on interrupt work, more time on new work. It makes sense that they're going to be doing um, or spending more time on doing the really cool stuff, right? OK, so how do we get here? This is important. How do we get to, to a high-performing team where, uh, and I'm not giving you metrics to say, hey, this is the, the level you have to get to. I want you guys to figure out what it means to you. I'm just saying, you know what? I think uh, number of deployments, lead time, and, uh, and uh, interrupt work are probably a good way for you to, to get there. So how do you do it? First of all, you have to start off with culture. Super, super important. <clears throat> you have to look at your values, and you have to look at team goals. So, uh, you know, if we look at values, they come in two sets. You've got your team values, and you've got your individual values. And it's important to get them aligned. If they're not aligned, if your organization wants to go left, and your people want to go right, you're never going to get anything done. And um, you have to define them. You have to make sure that the people who are in your organization are going to help you live up to your team values. Uh, and if not, you have to try to coach that out. Or given a very, very, very worst case scenario, you might have to vote somebody off the island. But control that, that value and let uh, those team values and, and let that direct where the team is going. Make sure that people are aligned to it and it's going to work. But it's, and again, I'm trying to keep this nice and broad and abstract. I am value agnostic right now. You guys can have different values in your organization. If you stick to it, you're going to do well and you're going to get high-performing teams. Um, but it's, it's not enough just to have those values. You have to live them. And I mean really live them. 
Um, Zappos is a great example. Uh, they've got 10 core values for, for their organization. And they, uh, you can find them published in uh, Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness, and, and outlined in great detail there. But uh, their, um, their onboarding process deals with a, a training period. And people are brought on board uh, for oh, some long time. I want to say it's like, like a month or two months, something to that effect. Paid the entire time. All they're doing is training for the position they're going to get. I'm sorry, they're training for the position they've already been accepted to fill. And then uh, somewhere along the way, they are told, um, you guys like it here? Here are our values, which you now know about. Can you live up to them now that you've seen them in action? If the answer is no, here is $2,000. Take our cash. We, we need you to leave but we want you to leave happy. Here's some money. It is worth $2,000 a person to them to make sure that their values and, and those, those structures of, of principles are kept sacred in their organization. So I don't know how you guys are going to do that, but find a way to live those values. There, there are some good techniques out there. Um, Work it into the conversation every day. If you've got five values, well, uh, every day during your work week, uh, have a conversation about a different one of those. Uh, if you can, uh, using a ticking system, uh, maybe JIRA, how about some acceptance criteria on each of those tickets for, for your values? How does this ticket, this amount of work, lead up to and, and honor the, those values? Uh, so there, there are techniques. Um, Probably uh, your best bet is to, to Google uh, corporate culture, corporate values to, to get them. Um, as far as team goals go and, and uh, culture as well, I want you to focus on uh, blame-free environments. This is, this is important. Okay? You uh, want blame-free environments because blame wastes time. I personally do not have enough time to sit around and blame another person in my team or in my organization for, for why something's gone wrong. Because all the while that I'm telling somebody that you messed up, my problem is not getting solved. Plus, it makes people defensive. If, if I'm going to go in and, and get aggressive and, uh, and start blaming other people, other people are going to start feeling stressed. They're going to feel defensive. They're, they may lash out. There will, be, um, there will be negative impacts for it. And it certainly, it absolutely certainly t uh, doesn't encourage people to go and take a risk. Oh, I, I, I can't take a risk on trying to make something better because I might get blamed for, for breaking something. Get rid of that. Um, there's a couple of ways that I would like you to, uh, to look at getting rid of uh, a, blame, uh, a blaming environment, to make it uh, a safe space, if you will. My favorite is um, the retrospective prime directive. I'm sure we're, we're all good DevOps and Agile people in here. We're doing periodic retrospectives, right? I didn't even need to ask you to raise your hands. I just knew that. You guys are awesome. All right, so start every one with this statement. Regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. I'll oftentimes ask people to, uh, to read that for me. Just pick somebody random in, in the, the team. Read the retrospective. That's our first step. Sometimes I'll even go and uh, pick on uh, a, a volunteer. Ryan, what does it mean? And you just sit and you wait. <laughs> Sorry? It means that people are doing their best. That it means that you do not have any saboteurs in on your team. And sometimes, quite honestly, I have no other way to say this, shit happens. And if shit happens, it's not anybody's fault. Not that they're trying to. Yes, sir. It also means that we don't believe in that we can improve by punishing people. Yes. Yes. Kind of 
Exactly, and it sets a positive tone, too. If you come in uh, to, to a meeting and you want to blame somebody, you're setting a negative tone. You are going to find somebody to blame for some problem. If you come in there expecting um, that you can't do that, expecting to, to work towards something positive, you're going to be looking for solutions. So set the right tone and, and lead the, those retros. Um, eliminate failure from your, your vocabulary. Replace it with learning. Great quotation from Linda Rising uh, at Continuous Lifecycle London two weeks ago. Um, she did a great keynote, and this struck me. I was like, that's exactly what it is. Um, failure is not a chance for you to blame somebody. It's a chance for the team to learn. <clears throat> There's a, the uh, allegory going around the, uh, the Internet. Um, and I can't find the source of it, but some people say it's coming from Lee Iacocca at Chrysler. The, the story goes like this. An engineer does something really bad, like uh, dropping an entire database without uh, any backup, and uh, it costs um, the, the company a million dollars. And he's, he's heartbroken and dejected, and, and the CEO's uh, asking him about this. So um, he tells the CEO, don't worry, don't worry. I'll have my desk packed by the end of the day. I, I understand I'm fired. And the CEO says, why would I fire you? I just spent a million dollars training you. That's turning it around. It's, it's getting rid of the, uh, the, the blame, and it's knowing, hey, wait a minute. This is not going to happen again. Do, we, do uh, any of you remember when uh, Bill Gates was on stage in Vegas a couple of years ago doing uh, a demo? and the, the entire computer blue screened on him. Everybody talked about the engineer responsible for that computer. And I'm like, oh, he's going to be fired. He wasn't. He was back the next year, and he was putting the computer together. Again, demo went off great because shit happens. And as long as you can focus on, on finding the solution to your problems rather than exacerbating the problem, you're going to have a, a much higher performing team. Let's move on. Executive support. So this is very important, to get as much of it from your executives as possible. And it can come in different forms and fashions. Investment, compensation, empowerment. We'll talk about investment first. By this, I mean uh, investing in people, making sure that they've got their tools, their services, uh, making sure that they've got time. Make sure they've got time. It's one of the most powerful resources they can have. Don't give people stupid deadlines, incredibly short, unreasonable deadlines, because the only thing that you should expect at that point is an unreasonably unfit product. Uh, let people do it right, because they want to take pride in their work. So give them all the things they need. You have to invest into them financially. You have to invest into them emotionally. That's important. Um, also invest in their training. Because as the allegory goes, the CFO says, well, what if we train all of our people and they leave? And the wizened CEO says, what if we don't? And they stay. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorites. But um, this, all of that's important because you have to give the people you want the tools they need. You have to give them the knowledge and experience that they need. If you don't, can you expect them to be high performing? Not at all. Compensation. I'm just going to draw compensation down to this book, and this is one of my favorite reads ever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> It's, uh, about, um, it's about compensation and our, our response as people to, to money. Let me give you the, the sum of this book. Once you start doing something that is even remotely complex, that requires rudimentary cognitive thought, more money does not make you more productive. Those performance bonuses and spot bonuses and, and uh, stuff that a lot of people tend to use to, to, draw, uh, to draw senior developers, hell, any developers, uh, architects, QA engineers into to doing more work and doing, doing better quality work, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Dan uh, in this book says the best use of money as a motivator is to pay people enough to take the issue of money off the table. That's all you need to do. You need to make them feel comfortable. If you want to motivate them, 
and you want to motiv motivate them to a higher performing level, Mr. Pink says you give them three things. You give them autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You give them the ability to self-direct themselves. You don't micromanage them. You let them decide, where do I need to be? How do I need to, to do the work? You give them mastery. You give them that, that uh, ability to go and make themselves better on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can do that by just giving them autonomy or, or time or opportunities to do it. You can give it to them by, by investing money into their training. So, thir finally, you give them purpose. You tell them exactly why they are there. And it's not, you are here because you're writing code that's taking data from a database and putting it on a web page, and then you're going to take data from a web page and put it back into a database. That's not why they're here. You are here because we need you to, uh, to write the code so that uh, we can have a much more efficient point of sale system uh, that's going to allow customers to, uh, to ring up higher volumes of, of, um, of transaction data so that we can improve the retail industry so that we can go and write medical software that is much faster and more reliable so that we can save lives give them purpose for what their job means and you're going to see an amazing amount of productivity when people get fired up and impassioned about it empowerment ask yourself is it a micromanaging environment are people trusted to do what they know um You can, uh, you can look at empowerment and tie some of these, these values to, together, some of these, these ideas. The, this idea of being safe and uh, being empowering and, um, and, and providing autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Look at the words of Lee Iacocca. He says, I hire people who are brighter than me and I get out of their way. Absolutely. Do that. Hire the best and brightest that you can find. Don't worry about their, their, um, their, their failure, like my failure in changing the title of this slide when I copy and pasted it. Um, what you want to do is you want to encourage a safe environment like you guys are giving me right now about my slide failure. Uh, it's going to, to make everything um, a lot easier. It's, it's going to, uh, to really put your organization culturally where you want that high-performing thing to be. And I haven't talked about the technology yet, have I? All I'm doing is I'm talking about setting the attitude. The technology is going to follow from that, particularly when people start looking at the autonomy, the mastery, and the purpose. Okay, so we're still looking at, at culture and uh, cultural areas, and I want you to look at the, uh, the silos. Do you have a siloed organization where there's a development group and a QA group and, and an ops group and you throw things over the wall? That's a problem. It, it really is. Um, there is a study out there. I just learned about it two weeks ago, and I haven't found the hard data yet to, to incorporate in here. But it's saying that with silo organizations, what do you typically have? You've got um, quality gates. Before, before a piece of code can go to production, development needs to say they're done with it. Before that code can go to production, QA needs to say they're done with it. Ops needs to certify it. Security needs to certify it. And um, each of these, these quality gates reduces the quality of the overall product. I can't go any further than that just because... Uh, um, I don't have the, the actual hardcore data. Uh, I will have it, and I will be tweeting it out as soon as I can get that. So please follow me on Twitter, and I'll, I'll make sure you have that, that information. What I can talk about is empathy loss, though. Because if you're, you're in different groups, uh, different cultures, then the development subculture, they're going to, to clash with the QA culture. Because these people over here, they're the ones who are getting in the way of my, my productivity. They're getting in the way of, of my ability to turn out features. And uh, it's along the lines of clashing motivations. Because different groups, when they're, they're siloed like that by, uh, by discipline, they usually get motivated in different ways. 
It's the typical uh, clash in DevOps. Developers are motivated and typically uh, finance incentivized by the number of features they write, the, uh, the amount of change they put in. The more features, the, more, uh, the higher the bonus. Ops, on the other hand, they want fewer change. They want stability because they're motiva motivated, incentivized by not letting uh, production systems fall. And the best way they get that is they get it working and then there's no change to the system. All hands off. We won't touch it, you won't touch it, nobody will touch it, we'll just let it sit here. And, and they clash. Development and QA, same thing. One group wants to turn out features, one group is getting paid to find every single little bug. Well, sometimes those bugs might not be important, but the incentives clash. And it causes uh, the, um, uh, a productivity loss all the way across the organization. So if you've got organizations and groups and silos within your, your, your company that are clashing, you're never going to get to that point where uh, you're getting 10 deployments out a day. Because who wants to go and clash with QA 10 times a day? Anybody? I don't. All right, um, so look at um, training as well. Uh, you'll need to, um, to cross-train your, your team. I, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you can avoid what I've heard today several times, the bus factor. I call it the lottery factor. If somebody wins the lottery and they, they leave your company, you want to be sure that you can cover that loss of knowledge. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of ways to do it. Pair programming, pair engineering is uh, probably one of the most powerful that I've seen. Uh, it definitely makes sure that two people are in sync. It allows people to, uh, to exchange knowledge and understanding at a very, very deep level. You can take it uh, as far as your organization will tolerate it. I've seen some organizations like ThoughtWorks uh, who could tolerate it a lot more. Every week, they would change the pairs. So this week, I might pair with you, and we would go about our normal work. And then the following week, we switch up, and I pair with you, and we go about the, the normal work. Same thing as the week before. We've just got different people. And what that's doing is it's causing more of a, of a crescendo of, of information and knowledge. It's making all that, that knowledge more, more heterogeneous and locking it within the minds of the team rather than individuals. And, of course, pay for that training. Invest in that, that training. Conferences. Um, actual uh, professional training courses, uh, college certifications, college um, tuition reimbursement, those kinds of things, all important. Your company has to do it. It's not as, uh, as easy for many of us in the trenches to make happen, but we can certainly fight the good fight and, and try to talk to leadership to, uh, to begin to, to make or, or be the agent for responsible change, to, to lead the idea. Communication is a, um, a cornerstone of good DevOps. It's a cornerstone of good anything. You know, it doesn't matter if you're talking marriage, friendship, or work. Good communication makes good things happen. I want you to be wary of Conway's Law in this, uh, this light. Anybody familiar with that? <clears throat> Conway's Law says, and I quote, any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So that means that however you guys are laid out and however you communicate, your product is eventually going to look that way. It looks like this. So if I've got four offices, Tokyo, Austin, New York, and, and London, and uh, eventually what's, what could happen is I could see different components of my application isolated in, in those particular areas. What does this do to, to my organization and my ability to, to be performant? Well, if, um, if I've got uh, the Tokyo office that's experiencing problems with user management, um, and the, the effect is going to be on the authentication of the people in the London office, one of those two offices is going to be screwed. When one of those offices runs into a problem, the other one's going to be asleep. This could be with anything in your organization. It could be down to the code level. It could be at the component level. Make sure that, that your communication is good and you're not suffering from ill effects like uh, Conway's Law. Next, I want to talk to you about this gentleman. His name is Colonel John Boyd. His nickname is 42nd Boyd. 
he's a, um, a colonel in the, uh, the U.S. Air Force. There he was. He's retired now. And he's got the standing bet uh, that goes like this. He, he's a pilot, by the way, a fighter pilot. And he says, uh, any pilot can start off flying behind him. And in 40 seconds, he is going to switch it around. And uh, he's going to have a, a view, a lock on, on the other pilot's tail. Basically, what that means is he is going to win in a dogfight. He could shoot the other, uh, the other pilot down. He will do that in 40 seconds, or he will pay $40. Any guesses as to how many times he's lost that bet? Zero times in 3,000 hours of flying. That's pretty impressive. It was an open-ended bet to anybody in the U.S. Air Force. How did he do it? Uda. It's um, a technique that he, uh, he promoted. Observe, orient, decide, and act. He says that if you can do these four things in order and faster than your opponent can observe, orient, decide, and act, you win. Hands down. It doesn't matter what the situation is. If your OODA loop is tighter than, than your opponent's, you win. We can take that concept and we can apply it to DevOps. I know it seems kind of weird because it's not like we're trying to go out there and shoot down our, our competitors, right? Maybe. Um, I suggest looking at uh, process improvements, going and continually looking for, uh, for ways to make things better. Does anybody know what the job of the, um, the, the market leader is in any industry? Staying market leader. If, if they settle on being uh, on the status quo and letting everything be okay, hey, we're number one in, in the industry. Why would I want to change something that works? Well, if they stay there, you better believe number two is trying to make things better. They're trying to tighten their, their OODA loop. And um, eventually they will, they will uh, get better. So look for, for starting with your, um, your technology and host retrospectives. These are going to be the uh, single, single biggest bang that you can get for, for improving things in your organization and getting to, to an area where you are high performant. And keep in mind, it's optional. This gentleman, um, Mr. Deming, who is a legend in, in the agile and, and lean manufacturing world, he says that change is not necessary. You know why? Because survival is not compulsory. You don't need to do it if you don't mind going down in big, huge, burning flames. Um, that's on the process side of, of the OODA loop. Again, you want to continually find ways to make things faster within your, your organization. For the first time, I'm going to talk about uh, technology. There's a technical component of this as well. Because Uh, this one is a rule that is going to tell you uh, you want to constantly be looking for a better thing to use than oil. Use it right now if you've got it. Find better ways to use it, but always look for the next thing. Changes is not necessary as long as you don't mind failing. If you want to fail, you don't have to change. If you want to succeed and you want to survive, you have to change. Those, those two go together. I just broke them up into two bullets. So um, continuous de deployment uh, is going to... Um, what? There's actually text here. Let's talk about this. <laughs> All right, so I have no idea what's going on with my slides at this conference. <laughs> 
Uh, so um, with uh, continuous deployment, this is the, the big technical, uh, big mammer jammer of how you can get to that high performing thing because we're talking about software organizations ultimately at conferences like this. And we have to go from, uh, from um, the, the, the concept of the coding space all the way to the production and the cache phase. Um, software nowadays is complex. And in order to do all the things that we need to do, if we do it manually, we're not going to do it very well because we introduce human error. But more importantly, it's going to take forever. Um, we need to take all the knowledge that we've got and we need to codify it into uh, to code and automation. And then use that to, uh, to continually perform the, the tasks. It's going to at least give us speed. It's going to give us speed and it's going to give us quality. Um, it's going to keep our, our teams, uh, or it's going to allow our teams to take the, the code and reduce our, our, our lead time, one of the, the two metrics I told you about. It's going to allow us to, uh, to turn out more deployments very, very quicker. That was another of the metrics I told you about. If, um, if we're raising the quality of the software because we're not doing manual tasks uh, and we're not having human error come in, then we get more chances to do new work because we're not going to be reworking bad decisions or, or bad bugs in the code. Uh, so um, you're going to have to invest in, in continuous deployment technology. Uh, that is going to base uh, or be different based entirely upon a lot of factors. Um, the, the tech stacks that you have at your organization, the kind of code bases that you're using, uh, if it's a mixture or homogenous um, uh, blend of code, uh, the amount of investment that you can put into it, and the type of, uh, of production environment you're going to. Um, continuous delivery and continuous, continuous deployment in and of itself is a really deep subject, and, and it's a talk all by itself, but I wanted to bring it in here just to say that it is probably the biggest way that we're going to get to, uh, to anything that is successful for, for a high-performing team. And uh, if I had to pick just one thing to harp on, that's it, continuous deployment. And I have no idea what happened to the most important slide of the presentation. All right, context switching. So um, who, th who here multitasks on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it good? Are you really more productive? You're right. Forbes magazine says that you are 40% less productive, and it's because of, of the way that you switch. Um, you can fix this with processes by, by setting clear priorities, uh, limiting uh, the amount of work in progress. Try to, to adopt a culture where you stop starting work. You start finishing work. And that, that's the problem. I mean, you know, I, I work on a task, and then somebody else comes to me, and um, they're like, oh, we've got something else. So I start that, too. And somebody else comes with something, another task. I start that, too. I'm starting, starting, starting. Stop starting. Start finishing. Finish this, then begin the next task. I'm going to show this to you um, with a name game. And it's going to be kind of hard to play it here, so I'm just going to run you through it. It basically starts off where we have one person who's a worker. We've got three people. Let's call them Robert, Gregory, and Janet as uh, customers. And uh, in the first round of the game, they're going to each iterate and give a letter of their first name for the worker to write down. So uh, the first round would be like uh, R G A or R G J, and then it would be O R A until all the names are, are spelled out. The second round, they switch things out, and you, uh, each customer spells their letter or, or their name um, entirely. R O B E R T. Then the second customer, G R E G O R Y. Then J A N E T, and uh, we time all of this. It gives us results like this. So um, these are kind of flipped, but multitasking down at, at the bottom. Um, what are the characteristics that we have here? Well, right at the beginning, all three customers, they get their work started right away. And that's what customers want. They, I want my work to start right away because that's going to make me feel like the most important person. I say start it, you start it. But look at how long it takes for the first name to get finished. The shortest name, Janet, doesn't get finished until almost the end. And um, 
but look at, look at how it compares to the monotasking. Janet gets her name out in you know, seconds uh, if she can just wait 20 seconds. Uh, also, look at all the wasted time that happens in here as the worker context switches and goes from person to person. Add it up to the amount of time that's wasted there. If you're going to be burning uh, your, your productivity and you're going to be burning away the hours of your day, you're not going to be high performing. That's it. Uh, because there, there are only 24 hours in a day, so you burn away 10 of them. Now you, you've got 14 hours to try to do those 10 or 20 deployments. You need every single minute of the day. Quit burning context away. Another way that you can do this is uh, with self-service. So um, give customers a chance to service their own needs and uh, make sure that there's no need to interrupt the team members that actually do this. So here's a, a good example of that. Um, my team, uh, we have a, a process where uh, in order for engineers to log into the systems they need, they need a VPN certificate. And only the cloud ops team has the authority to create those, those tickets. So um, it used to take the cloud ops engineers five minutes for each certificate. Uh, they'd get multiple requests a day, and every single time they'd have to stop what they're working on, generate the certificate, go back to what they're working on. So we provided them self, uh, we provide all the engineers a self-service mechanism. And uh, in the first two weeks, that was used 80 times by all the, uh, the engineers that we had in our organization. That was 400 minutes worth of time, 6.6 .6 hours that over the course of two weeks returned to the team like that. Plus, they didn't have to worry about the interrupt. So um, there's, it, there's a 40% loss in productivity just from being interrupted, but there's still um, a, 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 a solid number. It's like um, 20 seconds or, or two minutes or something uh, to get back into the flow and remember where you were after each interruption. We got all of that time back. Furthermore, developers, QA, all my engineers, they used to wait for, uh, for one of the, uh, the cloud ops engineers to become available to give them their, their certificates. Now they get it whenever they want. They don't have to wait for somebody else to be available and stop being a bottleneck. The entire organization improved uh, dramatically right away. And you can do this type of thing in two ways. I mean, you can, um, you've got to have a, a strong automation, of course, and um, I want to be sure that that automation is sacred to you. You treat that, that self-servicing code like it's production code, just like you were shipping it out to a customer. Because all those other engineers, all those other people, they are customers, essentially, at that point. Um, you uh, want to interface with those customers to be sure that uh, you understand what their needs are and what they're going to do. And you can also look at the current interrupts that, that each of your teams has. What, what are the, uh, the tasks that are interrupting them the most? go and codify those into uh, to automation, and you're going to see that, um, that performance increase the very instant you make that self-service. So uh, you make it self-service with two different uh, routes. One is with a self-service portal. It could be as simple as, here's a website that I'm putting up that's going to list all the scripts that we write all the, the bash scripts or all the ansible playbooks or, or anything else this is where uh these are this is the list this is what they do and here's where you can go find them run them on your own be happy uh what's even better than that is providing execution for the user uh for them so maybe it's a link that they click and a server runs the uh, the code and does the the task for them that's even better because they don't need to to understand you don't have to worry about uh the the qa engineer or the business analyst who doesn't have the the technical background uh getting the that automation to work one of my favorites as i mentioned i'm a chat ops uh uh enthusiast so um Oops, yeah, make them executable. Uh, you can also do uh, chat ops. Uh, create the automation into uh, to bots, and then uh, have them execute that the software and the automation through your chat software, whether it's Slack or HipChap or Campfire. Um, and what's great about this is not only is it going to give you that self-service um, for, for actually executing things, the chat rooms give you history of the usage. So now when you're bringing more people on board, 
to train them, uh, you've got uh, a recorded history of how people are actually using the commands and what's happening out of it. Uh, when uh, you get somebody else that um, says, oh, I need my VPN certificate, I can just say, oh, you need to go over to the bot's chat room, and you'll see that there's uh, commands there. It shouldn't be hard to figure out. And then I'm back doing what I want. So look at a, a lot of the soft benefits in terms of how you can get uh, information across with the various tools and technologies you use. Getting towards the end, I want to talk about scar tissue. So I'm sure we're all familiar. We probably all have our own scars, right? Um, what, about, what are characteristics of the scars? Well, they can be unsightly. Uh, they can... Uh, some of them can actually interfere with the, uh, the function of our body. Maybe a scar here can keep us from, from bending our arm quite as, as uh, far as we want. And sometimes they're embarrassing. Well, interestingly enough, our organizations and our companies can scar too. I want you to be uh, aware of that. And these scars can come across in terms of processes, policies, uh, even whole jobs. Here's a quotation. Policies are, organization, uh, policies are organizational scar tissue. They are codified uh, overreactions to unlikely to happen again situations. Let's actually see what that looks like, okay? And, and tell me if this reminds you of any of your companies. So uh, database goes down, and uh, our database manager, Bob, comes in and uh, says, well, we figured out what happened. And um, basically, a maid came in and, uh, and spilled a bucket of water and, and tripped uh, the, the power lines and, and took everything down. So now uh, we want to be sure that it doesn't happen again. Well, we'll make sure that uh, we put a policy in place. Yes, there, there's going to be a policy in place. Before anybody can go into the data center and mop the floors, they have to, to get permission for it. All right, uh, that's easy enough. We're, we're, we're just going gonna to chug along with this, this whole process. And it goes on for months until you hire Jane. And uh, Jane is going to be uh, one day future manager of, of the database group. So Bob says, oh, we've got this policy. Uh, you, um, you're going to need to make sure that any time the data center's mopped, uh, there's authorization given before. And Jane's like, oh, okay, this, this is part of the job. This is, this is how we do the job here? All right, I want to do the job how we do it here. And then eventually Bob leaves. And now Jane has an organizational scar. The company overreacted. I mean, yeah, the database going down was probably big, but it was an accident. We probably didn't need to go and establish a whole policy for it. Um, people can end up in jobs that were created through this, this over-reacting over, um, to, to a problem. And the, the organizational scar can stick around, and it can get in the way of, of your performance uh, and getting to, to that high-performance state. So in this particular case, it might not necessarily be a cleaning lady coming in to mop the floor. It could be every single time you want to change a schema, every single time you're going to import data or you're going to, to shard a database, you need to go and get that special permission. And it usually has to be manual. So that means that your automated pipelines, your ability to get to 10 or more deployments a day is going to, to go down the drain. So... Um, Leverage continual, uh, continuous improvement, as we talked about before. I want you to focus on uh, the root causes, not Band-Aids. And whenever you find a solution, ask yourself, is this something I can automate? If you can't automate it, you haven't found the solution. Uh, last but not least, you want to go and uh, set expectations. So uh, be clear about delivery expectations to your customers. And be clear th about what the team can input into to the requirements and, uh, and the, the outputs of the team. Make sure that uh, you know that everything is absolutely, um, absolutely autonomous. There are no duplicates. There are no ties. If you're going to have a backlog of, of work items, Everything is in order, one, two, three, four, and five in terms of importance. If, there are, if everything's a, a critical bug, 
Nothing's a critical bug. It's just like we heard in the keynote the other day from Michael. I think that with all the things that we've heard uh, today, and again, I didn't really focus on, on a lot of the, um, the technologies, just a, a little bit here and there. I, I really didn't give you a whole lot of solutions. What I wanted you to, to be aware of is in your journey, in your individual journeys on getting to a high performance DevOps team, you're going to have obstacles. And I got as many of the obstacles out there that I want you to be aware of. And uh, we can talk on, on Twitter. I can give you some, some suggestions and, and tools on how to get over some of the specific ones. But it's really going to be set upon the context of your organization as to how you get to high-performing DevOps. And uh, look, for, look for that... Um, Look for that, that continuous delivery pipeline. Look for the number of deploys that you're giving a day and how long these ch uh, the change re uh, requests take to get to production. Those are going to be um, probably the best leading indicators of, of your DevOps team's performances. All of this information uh, took a long time to, uh, to research and to uh, collect, so there are slides and slides and slides of links before we finally get to a place where I can let you download uh, the, the deck as well as my, uh, my typos and um, all the, uh, the information. I will say that uh, this short URL is static, so I will be updating uh, the slide deck periodically including handling the, uh, the lost information that uh, surprised me. And uh, once that's done, I'll just put it up in place so you can download it again at any time. Um, if you're curious as to whether or not you have the latest slides, please ping me on Twitter. Uh, I think I'm over time. Am I over time? Yeah, I think I'm over time. Uh, we can do questions now or we can do it uh, over beer. I don't care. All right. Thank you. Sorry for going over.